<laughs> so no, I've started beer drinking, and uh, but only the good shit. I think this is good. What do you think? Red blue is very good. Shimei. Shimei is very good. Wait for Hi. it. Oh, look at that. Just like it's Cheers. supposed to. Mm, that is good. Mine's watery and not that good. See, I'm not a beer. I'm not a beer drinker, but I, for some reason, I mean, my mom told me that drinking dark beer is good for your health. It's like full of vitamins or something. And so I was like, ah, oh, during this whole um, Corona period, I was like, oh well, I might just um, start drinking some beer. And then I. I would go to the store and buy the most, the best, most expensive beer I could find, you know, hoping that it tastes the best because I'm not a beer drinker and, and, and if I have a lot, it makes me feel sick, mostly because of the gluten thing. <laughs> but, um, but having a little one like this that's packed full of flavor and vitamins, I was like, yes. And, and so I started drinking these little ones and actually I really like it. But look at you. You're an adult. Well, let me drink it like I'm in a commercial. So it starts at We're this no, Yeah, there you go, there you go. Shimei. I tell you what, fuck, I feel like a Shimei now. <laughs> you know what? I'd buy a Shimei if that was the commercial. Holy Go on, do me your best, do me your best uh, beer drinking, just like, like I did. Go on, your best version of, if you had to promote a beer, how would you drink the beer? How would you put the bottle to your lips? <laughs> I mean, this is probably not going to be very good at all. I don't get any commercial work. I'm almost finished this one. Hang on. Oh. I'll finish that one. Hold on. What do you mean when you say, do my best beer drinking? Like what does that mean? Like for a commercial, you know, you said like, you have to hold it with the label in front and then you have to be like, like this, so like, like, I'm so happy drinking this beer. Or if you're a guy, you'd be like, yeah. Yeah, be, yeah, be good. <laughs> Billy, be good. I can't fuck up. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> okay, drink, here, I'll be your director. I'll be your director. Sure, now, sure. you've had a, a long, hard day working on the construction site or as a firefighter. Oh, let's place your firefighter and you just saved some koalas. And, um, <laughs> and, you, and you just come home and your girlfriend or whoever or your mate passes you a beer and you just sat down. Yep, there you go. Cheers into it. And now, and now you're like, oh, it's just been cracked open and you're so tired, and, but you're so like, oh, this is exactly what I need right now. This is exactly what I needed right now. Oh. Big head. And then Japanese subtitles. Have you, um, like, did you see all of Arnold Schwarzenegger's Japanese commercials? They're hilarious. No, I haven't. You're a big fan of Arnie, aren't you? I'm a huge, huge fan of Arnie. Hold on one sec. You going to bed? Is everybody else going to bed? We're gonna have to move. Tennis round, Ben O'Toole. Do you have a favorite director? I do. I really like Paul Thomas Anderson. Okay. I think he's, I think he's very incredible. Sorry, that's my brother. Keep going. Um, when you were growing up, or maybe it still applies, do you have an actor you aspire to be like? Yeah, when I was uh, when I was growing up, the reason I wanted to become an actor was because of Mel Gibson. <laughs> no. Yo, looks great with Bond hair. I wanted to become an actor from watching Mel Gibson in The Patriot. Uh, I've always admired his work. You know, I mean, the guy's an incredible actor. And as as I got, as I kind of kept going with it um, or kept pursuing it. Uh, Daniel Day-Lewis has probably become, I mean, it sounds like a bit of a cop-out, but it's for interesting reasons, I think. But he is, he's easily one of, he's an actor I would aspire to be like, 
I suppose. You know. To act like or to be like? <sighs> More so to be like. Um, I'd love to be able to pump out performances of his caliber and maintain his integrity in a way. You know, he's not he's not a fame whore, you know. Uh, he is really good at what he does and he gets the accolades and he gets, you know, what anybody would want to be famous for, he's kind of famous for it. You know, I mean, he's, he's like the Meryl Streep of acting. <laughs> People don't care about what cereal he's eating. I think he's kind of found the perfect balance. I'd love to be, I'd love to have a career like that where you're deeply, deeply respected um, for your work. Yet, you know, you don't have to be this thing to maintain a career, if that makes sense. Technical issues. <laughs> you kind of got like that, that uh, like Benny Hill type thing running in front of the camera back and forth. <laughs> Is there an actor you would like to work with? Funnily enough, it's the same person. I would really like to work with him one day. Um, I, I think that would be, you know, I'm not, I'm not somebody that really has like a goal in mind or anything when it comes to his career. I just kind of want to keep doing it, keep getting better. Yeah. Um, but I, I think if, if, I, if there was a gun in my head and they said, you know, perfect job, dream job, it would be to be in a film directed by Paul Thomas Anderson starring alongside Daniel Day Lewis. That would be, that would be sensational. I think it's so far from a reality, it's not funny. So I don't really want to think about it too much, considering De Lewis has quit acting again. But that's, that would be, I think, if, if you didn't walk away from a job like that, having learnt so much, uh, then you're a fuckwit that should probably pull out of the game. Agreed, agreed, agreed. All right, <laughs> next. Um, would you ever take on another role within the arts? Like, for example, directing, producing? Yeah, I would. I, I would, um, I'd like to direct uh, at some point, but I'm also not naive enough to think I'm ready to do it anytime soon. So I would like to, um, but I'm, I'm a ways off actually feeling like I'm in a position to actually tell other performers Potentially what to do in moments. I wouldn't have a fucking clue right now. But one day I would like to feel somewhat more responsible for a story. Yeah, I would, I would like to tell a story rather than just be a part of someone else. Yeah. I, I agree with you in terms of like the, yeah, you know, not having the knowledge base and then, you know, waiting longer. But I, I actually made, I made a short film because I wanted to see what directing a short film or what directing was like. And so I had no clue, none of the technical jargon, nothing. But I realized I love the editing process. Editing a film is where the magic truly happens. And I realized that through stumbling and editing this tiny little, you know, funny little short film thing that I made. And, um, and then you realize how much as an actor you rely on your editor as well. And on your director and your editor putting the story together. And that, so in terms of like, I reckon like, I'd say don't wait. I'd say do something just to play and to fuck around and you'll actually, it'll actually help. It helps everything. It helps your acting and it helps you to learn something new about directing. You raise a valid point. Uh, you know, it, it's typically trial and error that is the best educator. Um, giving something a go will teach me a hell of a lot more than just sort of surmising about it. And you're kind of right. Maybe now is the perfect time to try and do something because fuck, nothing's going on. Yovana. You may make a director out of me yet. Well done. <laughs> you sassy mates. Oh my God, Jersey. this is a reason to bring us together. You direct, I'll come and be your actress, like, you know, any day. I was about to make a very inappropriate joke. Oh really, go on. No, no, go on. Your inappropriate jokes are amazing, go. I'm not putting, no, you're gonna put it in. That's gonna sound creepy. Of course I'm gonna put it in, I have to. I'm definitely not saying it if you're putting it in. <laughs> definitely not. No, I'll tell you when we're not recording. Fuck you, Ben. Fuck you. Unbelievable. I'm trying to be <laughs> professional. 
I don't think anyone in your whole career is ever going to tell you fuck you to your face in an interview. <laughs> Not like that. Yeah, and the conversation is still going. So it's like, you're pretty special, yo. Okay, next. Um, I mean, I know, you, you know you're still in the early stages of your career, even though you've done some pretty amazing things to date. Um, but do you have like a highlight moment that stands out? Um, yeah, I mean, it, funnily enough, it was something I spoke to my agent about the other day. I was like, is the best behind me? <laughs> I know that sounds, it sounds so well with me. It's so like, oh, the end is nigh type shit. But, you know, working with Catherine Bigelow was a real dream. Um, you know, no, that's, that's a real, that's, yeah, that was massive. And being given an opportunity like that was, was huge. And I guess having her turn around and um, she said, uh, like, she was so complimentary of my work and such a fan uh, that it was really quite humbling. You know, it was kind of, you feel it was a dream, but I, I would say, I'd say probably my favorite moment was, is when Catherine and I disagreed on a moment in, in the film uh, in Detroit. And the two of us were standing there, you know, just sort of having an educated discussion about the character's motivations in that particular moment. Um, and, and it was that moment that at the end of it, she goes, okay, well, why don't we, why don't we do it your way? And then we'll see how we go from there. And I was like, okay, cool. And stepping back from that, and it was when I stood back from that, but I was like, I was just having a conversation with Catherine Bigelow about character. And she's going with my option first. And then we did my option and she didn't want to do her option. She was like, that's great. You're right. We'll do it that, that way. And you're like, but I mean, this is, this is somebody that's been awarded for her excellence and her brilliance. You know, the world has recognized how brilliant she is and she respects me for some reason. And, and that was a real, that's a real moment of, I don't know, it was, it was pretty sensational to feel valuable, if, if that makes sense. What is your philosophy when going on to set in terms of, you know, how you approach your work and how you approach the communication with the people you're working with? Um, I am a big one for, I always love, like, I'm a big one for commit to your choices and commit to your work, like do your homework. I think there's a very different thing between rehearsal and homework. Um, and, you know, with, as it is with film, you nine times out of 10, the rehearsal you'll get will be two minutes before you shoot, like I said. So everything you've got to do is like prep prior to it. And you can meet with the other actors and blah, blah, blah. And I, I'm a big believer that acting is actually what happens between two people. It's not what one individual does or anything. You know, um, there's a reason they're called offers. You know, it's generosity. You know, it's, it's being open, being able to give and receive and move and be. You know, the energy of a scene is totally dependent upon what two people are giving it and taking out of it. So with that in mind, there's only so much preparation you can really do in my mind. I'm not one for learning my lines meticulously or religiously or word perfect either, because I also... I'm a big, I'm a big believer in being in the moment with people and I don't want to be, I, I want to know the structure of the scene and where the writers want it to go and the director wants it to go and kind of basically where the story needs a scene to go. But that footpath is, is not, it's not set in stone. Um, and I, I love playing with the actors I get to work with and I love, I love having that freedom with them as well so that it feels spontaneous and feels immediate. It feels like a conversation or it feels like an actual breakup or it does feel like genuinely if this is the first time these two people have had this conversation because it is. You go on set and you're just real to yourself and you're committed to your character and, and you're not afraid to have those conversations with the relevant people to make sure that the job gets done. Well, yes, the, the, the story has to be the most important thing. Um, and I, I, I think, you know, this is something that happens. The more you work, the more aware of, of, uh, of, of and this is just my experience of it, the more aware of the, the sort of the greater narrative you become. 
And so therefore you realize that like, whilst every scene has to be dynamic, some need to be more dynamic than others. And, but with that said, there's a reason every scene is in the film. And you need to find the reason it's there. And that's not to milk it and make it super massive, but you need to understand its place and its importance within the story and respect that. But by way of preparing and, and doing things, I, you know, some people I find come in with a preconceived notion of how this scene's going to play out, what people are going to do, the whole nature of it, and blah, blah, blah. I, I don't suggest you do anything like that. When I say, you, you know, you, you do your character, if your character has a list, or if your character has an accent, make sure you're fluent in that accent, like in regards to improvisation and any, anything, because this is film, you know? I mean, anything could happen at any second. You've got to be, everything's usable. Um, so be prepared for that. So that, that's what I say when I, when I say, you know, go away and do your homework and be ready. Like make sure every offer and every, every reaction you make is within character, because I firmly believe you're going to be improvising as that character. But it all has to be for the betterment of the story. Mm. If it's not story related, you're just an actor fucking showing off. What would you say you've brought with you from drama school, where we studied at WAPA? And what would you say you've added on outside of that from just from working? So there's two questions in there, I guess. Yeah. I think the best thing WAPA taught me was to uh, just throw myself into things, you know, commit to something. There's no right or wrong choices. It's just what's appropriate and what's more appropriate. Um, and, and so I, I think from that, because I mean, oh, you know, when I first went to drama school, I was somebody that always had that energy of like, I'll do it on the day. You know, that insecure kind of, yeah, 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 I'm, nah, 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 I'll be right, I'll do it on the day. Um, so just throwing myself into things is definitely something I've taken away from it. Understanding that everything is a work in progress. Everything at any point of it is always a work in progress. What's interesting today will not be interesting tomorrow and being okay with that and going, hey, that's where I was. Um, a big thing I've picked up on set or, or I guess as time has gone on is it's It's probably, it's probably about commitment, I would say, and committing to a choice. Um, and that you actually don't have to do very much to be convincing. I, I think the best actors make the worst liars, the terrible liars. The reason being that you basically have to convince yourself that it's another truth. You know, I mean, it's, it's real. It's real, it has to be true. I, I, think, I, think, I think some of the worst acting is when people aren't committed to choices. They've kind of nonchalantly sort of just done something. Um, and I, I, I feel like you'll yield the best, you know, you, you yield the greatest rewards from the people you're working with as well as you make a, it's a huge solid, it's a firm fucking foot in the ground. It's a massive committed choice to a certain thing. So I guess, that, get... I guess that then comes down to then um, um, solid preparation beforehand in order to be, have, uh, have, be able to make confident choices, right? Yeah, 100%. You need to be the most, you need to be the authority on your character. Um, you need to be the authority on your situation. If people ask you a question, you need to be able to answer it. And if not answer it, be totally cool with it, I think, and be like, it's a great question. I need to think about that and be open with it. It's not a test. Who fucking cares about that? But to really be the authority on your character um, so that you can play in the moment. It's all about, I think all of that work is all about playing in the moment. And I think you, we're afforded those luxuries more in film and television, more, more, more so in my experience, more so in film. When people are willing to put two characters in a room and see what happens. Um, but I, I really, I personally, it's something I really respond to is, is doing your work, doing your homework, um, being the authority on your character and then, and throwing the person you're working with a curveball. Not trying to fuck them, but just 
just doing something to keep the scene present. You know, an actor I worked with, Josh McConville, he was a really great one when I graduated. He taught me, and he did this sort of incidentally, he taught me that it doesn't have to be rehearsal, it can just be refinement. Um, so from day one, you're just actually refining. Right, if you come in at a 70 and you work your way towards 90 over four weeks, he's like, that's so much better than coming in at a 20% and working your way towards a fucking 40. And then turning around three years later and going, oh, you know what I should have done? Because I mean, we think about this shit, it's gonna stay with us. Do you have anything on the horizon coming up? Um, I do, I've got, I've, got, uh, I've got a movie coming out. I mean, Corona's kind of fucked a lot of things. Um, we, we were doing the festival circuit, we're supposed to be doing it now but we don't know what, I don't really know what's going on. I don't know if it's going to be releasing it uh, later this year or... What's know. it called? What's it called? called Bloody Hell. Bloody Hell. Um, it's a fun one actually. It's, yeah, it was a lot of fun to make. Um, it's a movie about a guy that gets out of prison and he's kind of infamous and he wants to... Uh, get away from the world. He wants to get out of Boise, get away. And he ends up going to Helsinki in Finland and uh, ends up getting kidnapped and a lot of horrible shit happens. It's a comedy. It's a thriller comedy. That's your character? I'm that guy, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Very nice. It was a lot of fun to do. Um, it, was, it was really good fun. Fucking, there's a few movies I'm making, but it's just, I don't, we just don't know when. When I was in the States, I met up with Nick Cassavetes and these producers to make this film at the end of the year in Boston, which I was really excited about called Yankees Suck. It's this really fucking cool story. And Nick Cassavetes did, um, he directed uh, The Notebook and Alpha Dog. He wrote Blow, like, you know, he's like an old school Hollywood, icon and i met up with him and he was just so cool he offered me at the table he was just like you're my guy you're my <laughs> guy do you want the, do you want the part and i'm like yeah well, seriously and he's like you want it call your people we're doing it you're the guy and i'm like oh great oh, cool. why not why not that's fucking brilliant <laughs> hey on that on that actually um i mean what a whirlwind seriously like how are you how are you uh dealing with with everything you know australia you know brisbane wapa you know bit of sydney then hollywood i mean how are you um it is a big change and you know and when i was visiting la i i had like uh two responses to the place one was like shit this town is so diverse and there's a lot going on and there's this uh very infectious energy and I loved the I loved the vibe, and the vibe was crazy. And you you also have those you know, LA itself has so many different little pockets, you know, uh, which was brilliant. Like, uh, and then you know, in terms of the actual, you know, Hollywood stuff. Like, I met with the I had a meeting with the W an agent from WME, and uh, and that was an interesting conversation. Um, but it was like. I got, so I liked the, it was an interesting energy, the city itself and what was going on. But then at the same time from this meeting and also from talking to like TJ Power and some other Aussies that came over and are living and working there. Uh, you know, it's also like quite a tough balance, like a life work balance. And like, I, for me, I concluded I would love to work there, but I, I wouldn't necessarily want to live there. I went, when I went over to LA uh, to give it a proper serious go, it was the start of 2016. I moved in with a guy called Kick Gurry. And we just happened to hit it off and become like best of friends. And I think of him as like an older brother now. Um, you know, we, I, I joke that he's like, he's probably old enough to be my dad, but, but he doesn't, we both joke collectively about that. But, I, in that respect, I feel like I landed on my feet because in a town like LA, like just what you said, you, the community you find yourself is so important. That city is so vacuous. Um, it is 
you know, it's the city of angels. It's, you know, it's Hollywood. It's, you know, it, it's very, you feel like you're achieving absolutely nothing if you're not grinding, hustling, you know, I mean, so many people, and it's, it's a lot of white noise, you know, a lot of people over there like, man, it's about the hustle, it's about this. Are you printing off your headshots? Are you sending out your CV? Are you doing it? So you're like, it's overwhelming how much you think you need to do to be a member of the community over there. And you don't, right? it's white noise, it's, it's psychopathy, it's this manic, at risk of, you know, making fun of the people that do that. I'm not saying, you know, that I, it is ridiculous though. And it's overwhelming because it, it, it's, um, it, it pressures people like us to go, oh fuck, I'm not doing enough. I guess this is what you were talking about with that inner validation. You, you do have to believe you're worth something in order to try and sell that. You know, I, I guess you, you know, you're a hundred percent right. You can't, yeah. you, you must, you know, you must take comfort in the fact that you are worth something. Um, so I guess to answer your question, I, 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 I found myself living in that community, in a community with Kick and, you know, made a lot of friends with his friends and, and stuff like that. And found a very sheltered sort of community over in LA, which is great. Um, and in Sydney, I, I live with people that, I mean, I live with a guy called Jordan. You remember Jordy? You remember Jordy Steer, Jordan Steer? You oh, probably I'm remember his face. Not right now. You'd remember his face, but I live with him and he's got a new girlfriend and we live with this other girl who, who I haven't really lived with yet. But, you know, I like, you know, it's, I like to keep it pretty family, pretty family in Sydney, which is really great. Um, so like you were saying, you're like, you're 50, 50 between Sydney and LA. And when you're in yeah. LA, it's kind of like just trying to maintain a level head, I guess. But that could be really hard because I did get the sense that that place was very like busybody, oh. you know, like insane. Like I remember going to this in, in NoHo, that's how you say it, North Hollywood, NoHo. Um, oh. going, to this, going to this like this cafe and, and there are all these like actors and writers there. And this one guy who's like this 70 year old actor and he was, he still sort of had the mentality of a 20 year old where he's like, yeah, I'm going to make a big one day. And and all that kind of thing. And I was like, great, good on you, you know? Um, and I really, you know, I was like, good on you. But I was also like, wow, there must be a huge detachment from reality at the same time in that place because it feels like a bit of a time warp. Yeah, I think so. I think people convince themselves that they're doing it if they're there. You know, I mean, I think it's like a lot of people when they graduate from drama school, they're like, fuck this Australia bullshit, I'm going straight to Hollywood. And it's like, but nobody says you need to have had a career in Australia or anything. It's like, but I mean, if you kind of grew up there, it's like crawl before you walk type thing, you know? And I don't know, you, so many people move to Hollywood. Like, you see, so many people like, okay, so I, I think Hollywood is, is in, for, for a lot of Americans, is, is the same thing as a drama school. So moving to LA is the same thing as going to drama school, you know. And and I mean, you would have you would have spent time with those same students. That that's as good as it gets. All they ever wanted to be was at Whopper or at NIDA, you know. They wanted to be able to, you know, I got in, but they had no aspirations above or beyond that. You know, it was like really, you know. I don't think I know oh. anybody who didn't have aspirations beyond drama school. Oh, I, I've got well. Look, I mean, I, I think people did lip service. The people I'm thinking about, I'm not going to give names, but people I'm thinking about, they gave it lip service, these dreams, but I, I feel like you could tell it was like, this is all they wanted. They just wanted to get into drama school. You know what I mean? It was like, and everything else will take care of itself after I get out of drama school. And you're like, no, and that's when the fucking, that's when the work starts. It's not going to take care of itself. Are you serious? Here's a question for you, which based on what you just said, which I was thinking about asking you earlier, and now you just reminded me. Um, yes, that is definitely where the work starts when you get out. Um, how do you, what, uh, how do I ask this question? <laughs> um, you, you think about it. It's a double-edged sword question. Hey, what? Okay, I'm gonna, you think about it. You're getting a beer? Okay, go. Give me one sec. I'm gonna jump on the phone and 
Actually, can I like uh, stop this recording and then call you again? Yes. Okay. You got changed? <laughs> I put my pajamas on. Oh, there are your pajamas, nice. Look at your tussled hair. I love oh, it. Oh yeah, I thought I'd fluff it a bit. I should fluff mine a little bit too. <clears throat> Back to the question. Um, okay. I wanted to ask you, it's like hard to ask, it's tricky. I don't know how to put it into words. I still don't, you know, 10 minutes ago, I still don't know how to put it into words. Um, so, the, okay. Coming out of drama school, uh, what would you say, do you think in hindsight, um, was that key ingredient or key thing that helped you to get to where you are today? Going, going off that, that stupid thing that I really hate and I don't agree with, that they were even telling us at drama school, like, you know, 95% of you won't make it, 5% will. Um, that kind of attitude, which I think is bullshit. I think it's all in your head. And I think it's what you, what your perspective is and what your approach is. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, it does have, I think that luck comes in. And I also think um, the opportunities that you get and how you look does come into it, especially in Australia. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, all that, keeping all that in mind, what would you say is like an overarching, if there is one, uh, thing that helped you to get to where you are today? I think, um Years and years and years ago, uh, this guy, this director, Wesley Enoch, I auditioned for him for something. And this was while I was still at drama school. And after I'd finished the audition, he looked at me and he said, you're a very intelligent actor, man. And I was like, I didn't really know what to make of that at the time. I didn't know if that was like, I didn't really know what it was because I'd, I'd never been called an intelligent actor. I'd been called an instinctive actor, you know, things like that. Like I listen to my gut, I go in the moment. I'd never been called an intelligent actor and I didn't really know what I was getting at. And I think in hindsight, and I look back now, the biggest thing for me is I've always wanted to be, I, th I think coming from where I've come from as well, I am very aware of the reality of my situation at any given point. And when I first graduated, I realized I wanted to be this certain actor. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be getting these offers and playing these characters and these parts. But the reality of it is nobody gives a fuck how good a character actor I am. They don't. There's one thing nobody on earth will be able to do better than me. One thing, and that's me. Nobody's going to do better at all better than me. So I, in my head, I'm like, the one thing, the edge that I'm gonna have is, it's gonna be me. I'm gonna be, it's gonna be me. I'm gonna do me. I'm gonna bring myself to all of these roles as much as I can until it comes to a point that you start getting off of things. And then you can start exploring and developing and people go, I wanna see what you would do with that role. You know, you need to establish who you are. So that was, that was my primary focus. My focus was more on bringing everything to myself and how I would react in situations so that it was spontaneous, felt um, real and, and was believable, you know, because I mean, primarily these people didn't know me from a fucking bar of salt, you know, and an acting coach should, could say, he's a really great actor, but he really really cares. You know, I mean, these execs, the people that make these decisions, the money people, they don't give a fuck. They just want, they just want what's going to sell. You know, they just want money. And unfortunately, you, you know, I mean, you, you're praying that the creatives and the money agree. And you happen to be one of their choices. But anyway, long answer short, sorry. But basically, the, the way I approached it was, I thought the one thing that would be undeniable was myself. What? You know, nobody would do me better than me. Is it always going to be right? Certainly fucking not. But will it be memorable? Hopefully. Um, it'll be a committed choice. There'll be a character there. There'll be a presence there. There'll be something worth going off. And you're not going to get a fucking 19-year-old pretending to be a 30-year-old gangster. That's just not going to work. I'm not Timothy Chalamet. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not going to work. And you're not going to believe it. And I'm not going to work. 
So I did that and I got given a couple of opportunities. Um, and then after I started getting those opportunities, you know, I think you mentioned luck before as well. I think luck, luck's an interesting thing because luck, luck I think is, it's opportunity meaning application and ability. And one's application is completely in one's control. One's ability is again, completely in one's control, but opportunity is, is not, um, which is kind of an unfortunate thing. You cannot, you cannot control the opportunities that do or don't come your way. But you can be damn sure that if you are, if you're on top of your application and your ability, when that opportunity arrives, you'll capitalize upon it. And I believe that's how careers are made. Um, and that's how longevity is established, is that people know you're reliable long before they cast you. Um, it seems to happen is people sort of kick around in the fucking, in the undergrowth, like in the back, you know, they're, they're kicking around backstage long before they're in the front lights, you know, and long before the center stage, you know, that they'll be the people that came this close to so many things for so long and it's torture, but anyway, blah, 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 I digress. But, um, but that, that was kind of, that was my focus because I, I also graduated with, you know, a couple of guys my age, like Josh Brennan, you know, incredible actor. I'm not as good an actor as he can. And I would look at him and go, I'm not going to, I just, I have to be smart about this. I'm not going to have an act off. I'm just not going to do that. That's a battle I lose. So I'll do something else. I'll get other people to, I'll get, you know, it's a subjective craft. I'll do, I'll work on other things. I need to be intelligent. And when, Wes, when Wesley Enoch said that to me, that's what really, in hindsight, I was like, that's, I, I, I understand what he means now. He said, I, I was being smart because I wasn't the best. I try really hard. We all do. And it's okay to not be the best, but you know, um, that was, I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah. You pretty much put the nail on the head there. That's a brilliant, brilliant answer, but also it's a, a different perspective, which I, you know, not many people say like, you know, you're bringing yourself and that, self-value and that self-recognition that you bring that because that's what's going to need to be there in the beginning especially you know when, before they start giving you those roles to play with and stuff and what can you bring you can bring yourself and you might not necessarily be the best person in the room but oh there goes my lighting <laughs> but anyway well, done. but yeah it's like um yeah that's interesting i really i mean that feels like i feel like you kind of just that's a nice ending to our interview as well because that's a beautiful way to end it like that's a beautiful message for everybody to value themselves and not try and be something that they're not and not try and bring something that they don't have and i and that's a big thing because you know you're always trying to bring everything to the table and say yes i can do this i can do this i can do this but actually no like be what you are you know and like i was telling you when um, before the interview about what my agent said to me about the whole you know you don't fit in you know you're doing well you're getting good feedback but people don't know what to do with you um, because you don't fit into a box well don't fight it then don't fit into a box be yeah. Serbian European yeah. um, whatever delivery it is that's you know good for my choices and things like that and that's um yeah, that shit, that shit works. That shit sticks. That's what gets you somewhere because that's, that brings self-confidence, right? And then I Big think, time. yeah, and then it kind of, it kind of um, rolls on from there. That's really nice. Yeah. That's a really nice thing that you just said, actually. Really nice. Oh, thank you. It was a great, it's a, it's a great question. And it's something, it's a question I don't think I've ever been asked before either. And it's also a question I don't think I'd be that honest about answering unless it was this kind of environment, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I, you know, there, there is so much pressure placed on this and, and there is so much of what I am versus what I should be, you know, or, what I, or, what, or how I'm supposed to be or how, I'm, how I need to present myself as. There are so many, I mean, I'm sure you know them as well, there are so many actors out there that play the role of the tortured poet I mean, I think you've even accused me of being it in the past. You know, this like, you know, this like the tortured artist, like, oh, I don't deserve happiness. I'm, I'm, you know, 
like this act, you know, this, this, uh, this Just role. Like, like uh, keep it real, you know, keep it real. No matter what you do, keep it real. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's, uh, it's a big, I, I honestly, I think it's people trying to separate themselves from everybody else so that what they've achieved or what they've done seems less possible. You know what I mean? Like some people are like, like I heard this story today about this actor that's been sort of speaking to young students and young high school students talking about it can be done and believe in yourself and blah, blah, blah. But he's there suggesting that he spent most of his youth walking around with a journal and any opportunity he could, he would walk into an empty theater and just start reciting monologues and learning and working. And I'm listening to this and you know, this, this boy is asking me, he's going like, did you, Ben, did you do any of that? Like, is this stuff I need to be doing if I want to be an actor? And I was like, fuck no, it's not stuff you need to be doing if you want to be, like, if you want to, if you want to carry a journal around because you want to write, like, if, if that's something you want to do, mate, by all means do it. But if somebody's telling you that in order to be an actor, you need to keep a fucking journal, fucking don't worry about it. That is so stupid. It's not even funny. You know, if somebody's telling you that on your sp in your spare time you need to break into theatres and recite monologues, that's what you need to do to be an actor, you're being fucking lied to, mate. I'm telling you. You just need to be yourself. And honestly, that, that it's it's a story. I mean, again, you know, it's trial and error and experience. Less fucking wisdom is the daughter of experience. And I have learned that through all of my little, you know, bit things as well, you know, you, you, you do, you think that, you know, you, you try and, you do, I, I mean, I got so carried away when, when things started really going my way, work-wise. My ego went through the roof. I mean, my agents fucking hated ringing me. I was so arrogant. I was so, I was so fucking full of hot air. I thought my shit didn't fucking stand. I was like, mate, every audition I was going for, I was getting callbacks, I was going into that. I thought I was the fucking king. And I was a fuckwit, man. I burnt out big time drinking, oh, just horrible. Fortunately, my work didn't suffer for it because I didn't, my ego wouldn't allow me to let it, if that makes sense. Um, but a lot of my social relationships and like my, a lot of my personal relationships suffered for it and my working ones with my agent suffered for it. And, um, and I really regret that happening. It's just a bit of success came my way at the wrong time. I had a fuck with my head. I thought I was fucking, I thought I was like bigger than Ben Hur. And I was just a fucking kid that got a couple of jobs. That's all I was. Did your, you know, um, is it the same age that you have? Did they stick with you then? Yeah, we're, we're okay. Yeah, we're good. We're good. Um, fortunately, they, you know, they put up with me. But I, I put them through the ringer. And I mean, it, it kind of, it got nipped in the bud really quick. Like, you know, this wasn't three or four years of me being a, a prick. It was like probably just a couple of months of me literally thinking I was, I was God. And it's, it's painful to admit, I hate admitting it, but it's kind of the truth as well. It's part of who I was and what I, and the way I responded to it. Um, and it's really unhealthy. Um, and I think I'd love to see people not go through it because I think even Bill Murray says, you know, when you get your first taste of success in this game, everybody turns into a fuckwit. You turn into a fuckwit. There's no other way to put it. You just do. And you can tell yourself you won't, but you do. And I really hope mine's over. I hope that's, that's as fucking bad. Well, that's okay. I mean, that's also part of the, the learning curve because it's part of it, I guess. I mean, it's unfortunate those people who don't get over that. But, um, but if you have that stint, I think that's just part of it. But it's interesting what power brings. A bit of power, I mean, they do say power corrupts, right? So I guess that's mm. something you have to taste, which probably helps your acting at the end of the day. Say you get like a godfather type character one day, you know what I mean? Or something similar. You know where to yeah. go. You know what's required. So, you know. so it's like, um, why not? I don't think that's bad. I don't think... I, it's bad when you don't evolve from there. I agree. Um, I agree. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. You're very right. 
if you don't um, if you don't learn from it, yeah. If you don't if you don't evolve from it, you said it perfectly. If you don't evolve from there, it's bad. It's really bad. Yeah, well, I don't have anything else to ask right now. Maybe we'll have a one, part two someday. Um, but I think well, that's about it. What do you think? I'm, mate, I'm happy. I'm very happy. Thank you. This is really fun.